be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the pod. And I really appreciate it if you go on YouTube and subscribe. It's the Field of 68 YouTube channel. You can just type that in and look it up. You know, we really want to monetize this so we can keep pumping out good stuff for you guys. We need to get to 1,000 subscribers. I think we're about halfway there, maybe a little more. So we need your help. You know, maybe you're not even going to watch a video. Just go out there and hit the subscribe button. We really appreciate it. Uh, we got a great guest today, Brendan Quinn. Um, you know, covers Michigan and Michigan State for the athletic. Really great guy. We talk a lot of great stuff about media, you know, his job and how he got into it and, you know, the relationship between players and the media. We dive into Michigan basketball a lot, you know, you know, more than we have in the other episodes. So it was a really a lot of fun talk and, um, you know, really, really happy with how the interview went. And I think you guys will enjoy it a lot. But before we get into that, I want to talk about a great sponsor we have in DraftKings. While the holiday season may be winding down, the sports calendar is in full swing this week. From collegiate to professional sports, there's no shortage of action, and there's no better place to get in all, the, all this action than DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app. If you haven't tried out DraftKings Sportsbook, what are you waiting for? To celebrate this year's college football playoffs, DraftKings is giving all new users the chance to bet on any semifinal team to win the championship at 100 to 1 odds. That's right. All you have to do is bet $1 on any semifinal team to win the championship. And if your team wins, you cash $100. It's easy. While we're all excited for football, let's not forget the 2021 basketball season just kicked off. So head to the app now and check out all the DraftKings daily odds boosts. DraftKings is safe and secure and reliable, making it easy for you to deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. So go and download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code FIELD68 when you sign up to get 100 to 1 odds on any semifinal team to win it all. That's code FIELD68 for new players to get a shot at $100 on any semifinal this week for limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Brandon, what's up, man? How's it going? Oh, it is going still usually this is like a much more fun time of year you're like flying all over the country and going to games here and there and flying into cold ass big 10 destinations and yeah exactly getting, I mean, all, getting all the marriott points and now it's just nothing yeah i mean last game michigan played nebraska like is it fun to travel to nebraska anyways i like it uh-huh. i mean i like going to random cities i like going you know go find a random bar and ask the bartender you know what's your favorite weird restaurant and then go to a weird restaurant and stuff like that i i love being on the road i love traveling i love getting delta miles and i love marriott points <laughs> uh i mean it was a little easier when i covered the sec that's for damn sure but yeah that's true you know once you learn these towns like there's something kind of oddly endearing about going to lincoln and madison and these just ridiculous cold places like in the dead ass of winter and like you've gone there like i've gone there enough um where uh, you you don't even question where like the rental car yeah pickup is at the airport you just like land you walk you get your car you do your thing and it's like it's comforting after seven years on the beat now i feel like I don't know. It is nice. What, the what's the meaning of it all, Stu? I don't know what to do with myself. Yeah. I, I always <laughs> hate, like, people are like, you need to go to New York City, you need to go to L.A. And I'm like, I want to go to a spot where, like, I find the spot. And you go to New York and L.A., some of these big cities, I'm like, I can't maneuver around these towns. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. where I'm going. There's too many spots to hit up. Like, yeah, send me to Indianapolis. Like, that's easy. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, there's, like, random places where you just know the hotel. Like, the, the legendary Coralville Marriott. And I always say that like every Big Ten, every team, every beat writer, everyone stays there. And it's just like, oh, yes. It's a horrible like that, Marriott. It's my favorite hotel. Yeah. Low key. Good spot. Super and then there's nice. that little steak place like midway down the street. See, I yeah, got yeah, all yeah. the cheat codes when I came on the beat because it was still Mark Snyder and Rod Beard. They'd already traveled the beat for years. And I was able to just tag along with them and learn all their secrets. Yeah, that's good. I don't want to give Mark Schneider too many compliments. I mean, he trash talks me a bunch on Twitter, but uh, I do love that guy. Uh, he's I mean, a really nice guy. <laughs> he actually came to Israel. Uh, he came to Israel one time and uh, visited me, and it was really nice. Sat down for dinner. It was cool. Really? Yeah, I'm gonna, Mark's I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, trash talk my mom a little bit. Mom and dad, they they have never visited me. And Mark Schneider, the Michigan beat writer, dad vis- has visited me in Israel. So if my mom's listening to this, it's a little guilt trip that I'm pushing. I like her. the parent trash talk. That's that's a nice touch. No, Mark yeah, is uh, keeps, it, keeps it alive. 
Mark is good, good people. When I came on the beat, he had, he didn't have no reason to treat me as well as he did, but uh, it was, we had a great time. Yeah. You came on in 2013, you were saying, and kind of in the middle of freelance success or, you know, mm-hmm. kind of right in the middle of it. And, you know, how was that? And trying to, <laughs> I don't know, like those guys, Mark Snyder, Rod Beer, like they saw the, the days where, you know, they, they told me later that Beeline was close to getting fired. <laughs> so like how was your perspective different like it was seemed like did you have like much try but i guess there was always the plain stories and all that enough drama going yeah. on college basketball but no it was it was great the uh so i came from tennessee i was covering the vols for the knoxville news sentinel um i covered conzo martin's first two years so i just missed bp and uh when when i got here they were coming off the national championship right um Michigan football was kind of in the fog of the, the you know, tailish end of the Brady Hoke era. So just, you know, a fan base this size and a brand like Michigan, you know, being hot in basketball and being a basketball guy covering it, it was like lightning. You know, I mean, I loved yeah. it. Um, so it was great. And, but Beeline was just such a tough nut to crack. Like, you know, he just, would refuse to open up. He just didn't want to have a relationships with people and stuff like that. And I mean like real relationships, right? It's one thing, you know, you have your bullshit at a press conference, whatever, but like actually getting to know somebody, he was just so disinterested in that. Um, it took a long time, but you know, kind of got there. But those, uh, that early span was, was great because they were coming off the final four. And then that, that Stauskas team, was just awesome to cover. It was a great group of personalities, right? They all had stuff to say. There were a lot of good stories. And uh, and then they went to the Elite Eight, so I'm not going to argue with that. you have a favorite Michigan team that you covered? In terms of personalities, um, would that be it? That one is definitely – yeah, that one is probably the 18 team, um, obviously the Final Four group, because um, mm-hmm. that just turned into such a thing, you know, from the pool shot – to you know beeline getting his second final four there was just stories all over the place mm-hmm. and uh you know you had like the xavier simpson thing he kind of became like a little phenomenon in and of himself and they were a lot of fun to cover and like the difference between that and the 13 team is now you know mark was off the beat right rod was now covering the pistons um and i was kind of like you know had the longevity I'd been around and now I had the relationships to really do the job kind of in a much better way than I would have been capable of in 13, 14. Yeah. How was that walking in and you're like kind of the new guy, the media face and beelines already, you know, distrusting of media, you know, they want to share too much, which I understand to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, do you have any funny awkward moments where you're trying to get them yeah. one or like <laughs> this media is, scrums? You'll like this one. So when I got here, uh, you know, I call Y Rot, introduce myself. We go out and have lunch, and I asked to have a uh, uh, oh, sit down with John to introduce myself. So I go in, I say, you know, my name's Brendan Quinn I'm from Philly. He's like, all right, where'd you go to high school? First question, where'd you go to high school? He's not even from Philly. First, first question, where'd you go to high school? I say St. Joe's Prep. He goes, oh, you see the eyes get wide. It's like St. Joe's Prep. He's like, that's that's a Jesuit school, isn't it? I go, yes, it's a Jesuit school. I said, and I went to St. Joe's University. I was, oh my God, you know, all this Jesuit education. By now he starts rambling. Like my father was a track coach at St. Joe's. He was loving all that. And uh, he starts giving me like a scouting report of the uh, like parishes in Ann Arbor of like where the good homilies are and stuff like that. And I'm saying, I'm not in person. I'm not a religious person. But mm-hmm. I'm, like, I'm playing along with it. Right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's going to be great. Can't wait. I appreciate the scouting report. And uh, I thought oh, I'm in, you know, everyone tells me this guy doesn't want to have a relationship with anybody. You know, I'm, I'm made in the shade here, but of, of course, lo and behold, you know, next time I see him, he just has no time. for that. <laughs> And when I ended up writing a big long profile on him later that summer, I originally declined to talk at all for it. And then I went and interviewed like 30 people and I sent him a list of all the people that I interviewed with. And I said, now would you be willing to sit down? And he gave me 45 minutes. I probably needed like a four hour interview and he gave me yeah. like 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> like, all right, Brendan, you wrap this up. 45 was good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think like I asked these, talked to Kathleen too. And, uh, 
they were uneasy about that, which I never understood because if you talk to Kathleen, she's like a nice person. It was oh, like totally fine interview. Like she would yeah. never say anything out of line. And it's no. like, why is this a big deal? But that's just kind of them, you know, and it's, you, it takes years to really kind of understand the kind of the intricacies of the family. And, um, sure. you know, they're relatable in a lot of ways. I used to, I got, I got old Irish Catholic parents back home, right. You're just private people and all that stuff. So, you know, I got it after a while, but it was very interesting trying to kind of learn what makes that dude tick. Yeah. How is that transitioning to covering Jawan? And he's part of the newer age and, you know, yeah. been around the NBA and, you know, the Fab Five where everyone, like he's just being looked at and dissected <laughs> since the time he was 18. So is, uh -huh. is there a difference there where maybe he's more open? I, I've seen some quotes where, you know, he keeps it pretty – pretty tight and, and pretty general, which you do, you know, some basic questions after games, but how has that been compared with, uh, with Beeline? Yeah, he's definitely, I mean, I, there's no comparison there because they're just so ridiculously different, right? You had the one guy who started from a JV coach and climbed his way yeah. up to D1. And then you had the guy who was at 22 years old, one of the most famous athletes, you know, in the U USA. So yep. um, Juwan has does not really ha it have a level of interest in having kind of personal I think relationships with with local media and stuff like that and that's you know I don't begrudge him for it I totally sure. get it and you know when uh, and some of the stuff that I've done on the on his past and wrote a large piece like on him being the first NBA guy to get a hundred million dollar contract right and I wrote you know another large piece about you know where he grew up in Chicago and you can't kind of I came to kind of understand the picture of what we're dealing with as reporters when it comes to Juwan. Cause you know, when he signed that hundred million dollar contract that ended up really framing kind of the way that he was treated and covered in a lot of ways uh, throughout his pro career, it was anything he did. It was always, you know, well, he got the first hundred million dollar deal. Yeah. Right. So, you know, he was easy to knock for that. So you go from being part of the fab five and the, the heat that, the media attention um, kind of was put on that group right at Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then you go from that to being the first hundred million dollar man and you're playing in Washington, DC, right. You know, he got there. I think he got popped for you know, whatever. He got in some trouble when he was like a young kid, right in the, in the league. And I think that that brought a lot of negative media attention and you start to just kind of understand like, yeah, you spend 25 years around the NBA yeah. and you deal with media for the better part of 30 years plus of your life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not surprised the guy isn't here handing out a cell phone number and looking to, you know, shoot the shit on a regular basis or opening up his door for one on one interviews or really being in, that interested in um, even doing press conferences and stuff like that. Um, I get it. And, you know, <laughs> sometimes I've talked to a couple people about this, like, the interesting thing about some of these former, you know, superstars who have grown to the college level as coaches, so Juwan, Penny, Jerry Stackhouse, is like they're so crazily famous, yeah. right? Like these are guys who are, you know, they have been recognized in airports for decades, you know, that have LeBron's cell number and like that they just exist in an entirely different world than even your most famous college coaches. Right. Yeah. Like, like Calipari or, or, or stuff like that. Like, let alone your run of the mill Big Ten coach. Right. Like, yep. who cares about Mark Turgeon? If Mark, Mark Turgeon could walk through DTW and no one will know who he is. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it's just such a different world to live in. And like, that's Juwan. And once you understand, once I understand that, then I'm not going to begrudge not having relationships like I can have with. Um, other coaches because it's just not going to happen <laughs> yeah it's funny how that it can be so great I loved the guys that were part of the media Michigan writing team and mm -hmm. after the games they were great I tried to be as candid as I possibly could even though our media training was to keep everything under wraps <laughs> but it's so like a snap of a finger like the the relationship can get sour real quick uh-huh and I don't know if that's changed at all. Like, have you experienced anything like that? Has that changed 
Uh, is it is it more difficult if people don't want to be bothered during this pandemic? Like, has this year changed? Like, how has that been in the last few years? Well, first of all, this year sucks. This year's yeah. a total wash. You know, we're doing everything remotely and it's useless and you don't, the biggest thing that's missing is relationships mm. and, you know, being able to talk to guys one-on-one or being able to, um, you know, have repeat questions where, you know, if you're someone who's dealing with a certain player or anyone really, and, you know, you get a chance to actually ask follow-up questions and follow-up questions and show this person that you care and you understand and you are genuinely curious and you're not trying to catch them saying anything or anything like that. Um, that's how you develop real relationships, right? And that's how um, you put yourself in kind of a position for someone like you or whoever to want to explain something or want to tell your story or whatever it might be, right? Mm-hmm. Um So that's gone right now, which is terrible. But to your question, like, yeah, I, I think it's worse (laughs) than it has been in terms of people um, being so scared of saying something that becomes a tweet that ends up defining them or, or getting them in trouble or, um, and this goes from players right to coaches anymore. I feel like most of the coaches are so boring yeah. anymore. You know, there's just like, I, I came up at the very tail end of kind of the glory days of the big East when it was still, you know, Calhoun and Bayheim all in the same league. Right. And you would go to media day and Calhoun would like talk shit on Bayheim. And then like the writers would go over to Bayheim and be like, Calhoun just said this. He'd be like, Oh Yeah. And then he would say something. Everyone would go back to Bay. Like, it's just a different world. You know, yeah. now everyone would just be sending tweets and and just basically trying to burn it all down constantly, right? So everyone's worried about doing the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing that, um, you know, there's there is a level of nuance when somebody says something of being able to, like, present what they said yep. without – just putting it out there for people to interpret or without context or, or intentionally wanting it to go viral just because you want the attention, you know? And so that's kind of where we're at right now. And I mean, I I feel really old talking this way. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I read a lot of your stuff and it seems, you know, very genuine, not really gotcha, but have you had a coach come back to you or, is there like one coach you know that just doesn't like you, or there was one instance where like he thought you were trying to get him and put you out, put him out of context? Um, I do know some coaches who are, I don't think like me. I wouldn't say it out loud. Sure. Um, but um, no, I mean I've had people not like what I wrote or my opinion on things, but it's always just been like I just disagree with you and things like that, or you know, Izzo calling and being like, that question you asked was stupid. And I'm like, well, it wasn't, you might not like it, but it wasn't a stupid question. Um, but other than that, no, not really. I mean, one of the, th- the big things I feel like is that I try to do is if there's something that is going, that I know is going to draw a reaction, I try to tell the person I'm writing about, I'm writing this. Sure. I'm writing this. And if you want something to say or to add to or to explain whatever, go for it. You know, that's good. That's a, but that's this a is what question. this is what I'm writing. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That plays right into that psychology of humans. Like, because I think a lot of times we think that what we say is going to be turned into a story. But if the story is already out there, like if you're playing bad or right. there's some bad blood or something like that story is already out there. Like everyone knows everything. So, yeah, like you're not going to stop it. I mean, we, we would play bad and guys would get, guys would get pissed and, you know, coach would be happy and they'd be short, but like, I don't know. I thought losses, it was the easiest time to be honest because mm. that's when the most problems are. And, and you, and you kind of know exactly what happened. And sometimes you win and you're like, what the hell? Like, how do we just win? Right. I don't know. I, I always, I never had a big problem with it, but uh, we were definitely trained on it. That was for sure. Do you think um, over your time, like as, as a college player, did you realize like from beginning to end that you can kind of dictate things 
based on what you say out of a post-game situation. Like if you want a message to get across, like you can use that as a vehicle to do so. I've, I've wondered, because, you know, pros know that stuff, right? Because they've been doing yeah, it yeah. for years. A quarterback gets up. They know that if they say something in that press conference, it's something that will end up resonating back to the team without them saying it like in a team meeting or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, did you realize that like at the college level? Uh, I did. I am a very risk averse trash talker. <laughs> uh, I'll never forget when BJ Mullins, who by the way, has B and J just on his forearms. He got that <laughs> in high school and I'll just leave it at that. I've never <laughs> had an idea, but uh, he came out his freshman year and Basically, it was just talking the most trash about Michigan. We haven't even played them yet. And obviously, they, they kicked our ass. Like, mm-hmm. they were so good. But I was, like, picturing in my mind me doing that. And, first of all, then scoring, like, four points and us losing. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think I want to do that. But it was definitely – I definitely knew, like, messages could be sent. So I was very cognizant of not to be – not to be, I don't know, overly – overly cocky in certain situations, like especially with our rivals. I remember there was one game we played at Northwestern and had a media session, a little scrum, like right before we left. And this was my senior year. So we were feeling good. Like I won at Northwestern before, I believe. And, you know, I thought we could beat them, but like wasn't trying to be, I wasn't trying to trash talk, but someone asked me about, the crowd or something. And I was like, yeah, you know, it doesn't really get too loud in there. Um, and honestly, like a lot of Michigan fans show up to the games, you know, you got kids reading, studying like in the stands right before the game starts. So like, it's not too crazy. I'm not too worried about an away atmosphere in this game. And that was the dead truth. I show up and I had no idea that this like caught in the little Northwestern <laughs> fan <laughs> section but like I show up and kids are studying in the, in the student section. And I'm like, dude, they, I come out and they're like trying to trash talk me. I come out with a toothpick in my mouth. <laughs> like even like a little. The fonts? Yeah. Like a little. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to play into this a little bit. And they're like trash talking me. And then I hit like a couple threes, to like win the game, seal the game. Like we, bunch, we hit a bunch of threes and over, it went into overtime. But then the at the end of the game, there was a go blue chant. And I swear it was the loudest chant the entire night. There's the loudest thing in that entire gym, the entire night. So after the game, somebody asked me about it. So I made sure to comment like, yeah, the Michigan crowd was the loudest in the whole gym. And like really kind of rub it in, but like, it didn't feel too good. Cause it was Northwestern. Like right. they had, they had right. good players and everything. Crawford and Sherna were great. They had a great team, mm-hmm. but like that was about the most I did. <laughs> did you feel like you were, like one of my biggest problems that I happens all the time is the idea of like leading questions where, you know, people will ask, Oh, this and this and this, and kind of build you into saying something that you might not have been looking to actually say yourself. And if they say it and then suddenly you just repeat the question, well, now that's your quote. And yeah. like, you see it all the time and um, like, that's where so much shit comes from that, you know, oh. people just have no idea behind the scenes, like how someone actually gets to a point of saying a certain quote. Well, oh, if you yeah. read like everything that was said right before that, a lot of them become pretty self-explanatory. Did you, did that ever happen to you? Not really. Are you <laughs> um, cognizant of it? Yeah, I'm pretty cognizant of it. I try to cut it off like right away, but like, I never got too upset with those questions. I knew that was just part of the job. I mean, we had guys that would get pretty pissed with that stuff. Um, But there wasn't too, there wasn't too many like gotcha questions. There wasn't anybody like trying to get me to smack talk another teammate or say Mm -hmm. exactly what's wrong. And if I, you know, knew what was wrong with the team, trying to put myself into, I mean, there were plenty of times where I wanted to complain about teammates. Don't get me wrong. Or even <laughs> probably even coaching staff. I mean, there's always something about somebody else. Um, but I think I, what I did was just kind of put myself first mm-hmm. and then kind of, you know, maybe lead into like other guys try and do it that way. So like soften the blow if I really wanted to complain about something, but uh, yeah, they trained us pretty well. I mean, it was funny to see like guys just say like verbatim, 
you know, I remember Tim Hardaway Jr. when he was young, just like saying verbatim, like what they taught us. And I'm like, ah, he'll figure it out. Like, uh-huh. it's uh-huh. good that he's not at least like getting too into it. But I don't know. I, I They just teach us that it's like a joyless thing that you have to like be aware of. And I, and I understand right. that's a bummer. The things that you have to be aware of. But like, I, I thought it was fun as hell. Like, hey, my quotes in the paper, like I'm in the mm-hmm. paper, like. Hey, that sounded actually pretty smart and witty. Mm-hmm. Like I thought it was, I thought it was cool. I remember one time I said, we beat Michigan state and I did a little smack talking. I said somebody, I think it was actually Mark Snyder. He asked me something about this being like the biggest one of the year, or is this a goal or something? Cause you know, Michigan, Michigan state, Michigan, Ohio mm-hmm. state. It's like, if you don't beat one of them or you do beat one of them and the season's bad, like it doesn't matter. Like if you beat them, it's a big deal. And like, that's not what I'm here for. So I remember saying, yeah, the game, you know, beating Michigan State is not the holy grail of the season right now. I came back and my dad was like, wow, you worked in holy grail into a quote. And I was like, yeah, I'm a pretty smart guy. I don't know what to tell you, man. So I thought stuff that's, like that was really fun. That's pretty good. That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I just – I kind of miss it sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Israeli media is not quite, quite the same. No, they're not flocking to the locker. Either, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been pretty good. Um, I wanted I mean, to I'll tell you what I was going to say, like we're missing out on it this year. Like that idea of kind of being able to really take the temperature of teams. Yeah. Like, you know, last night I would have been in Minnesota and been in the locker room with Michigan Man. state after that game. Right. And like, you know, now it's only Zoom calls, right? So they trotted out Foster Lawyer and Thomas Kithier. And those guys, you know, they tried to do the best that they could. Hard questions, you know, no one's happy. It's basically, you know, it's shitty right now. And they're just trying to kind of talk through it and say the right thing. Yeah. No, if this were a normal year, you know, Aaron Henry would have to sit there and answer some hard questions about himself and the team. And um, Rocket Watts would have to answer some hard questions about the point guard situation and stuff like that, right? Like. Right. And you really get a read. And it's not only just like quotes that are used for a story, right? As like a beat writer who's there, you just learn so much being in a setting and being able to kind of watch people and see people and, you know, maybe have a conversation without your tape recorder on, right? Pull an assistant aside and, you know, what the hell is going on with this? What's going on with that? Blah, blah. You just know, you come to such a better, well-rounded understanding of really what are kind of some of the inner workings things. Because then, you know, sometimes you get told like, Hey man, this guy's got something going on at home. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but there's like some shit going on with this guy. And like, yeah, just so you know, you know yeah, what I mean? You Before got, you, you go and say this or say that, buffer, yeah. you know, there's like, it, it's just very different and it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Like I, t- I didn't realize how much I probably took for granted just being able to kind of have certain access points that are now no longer there. Yeah. I always love that too, where you can have a, you know, outside of the mic kind of conversations off mic conversations mm-hmm. and build those relationships. And then at the end of my four years, when there was like profiles on me and Novak, those were super cool. And they came from people sure. that kind of, you know, knew me as well as anyone uh, outside of the program and to see what they had to say and followed and kind of get their perspective on things. That was really mm-hmm. cool. And like, yeah, this year you're just missing out on, on so much. I mean, how do you, can you even, write a profile on a player right now like can you even get enough of a feel i mean I, you do it just because you still have to it's just not going to be as good right. you know right. when when i profiled xavier simpson before you know, like i drove down to lima and spent like two days there and you know hung out with q his father you know multiple times had lunch multiple times you know and like there's a difference between just getting quotes and like having conversations where you really feel like you can write with any level of authority about someone's life. Like that's not a s- small deal No. to just tell someone's story and expect that, you know, anything about what you're talking about beyond, you know, we had a half hour conversation and you told me this version of events. Yeah. Like that's not real, you know, like no. you need a level of real understanding and under these circumstances, Maybe some people can do it. You know, I, I'm not going to be able to do it as as I have. I, I feel like in the past, at least as comfortably, you know, I'll still try and stuff. That's the job. But yeah. this is not the way it's meant to be done. No, it's that's the other part is like, 
especially in, especially in the college ranks where you guys follow these kids and I knew early on, like you guys are trying to write the best thing that you possibly can write. Like there is no gotcha thing that I was really worried about. It was like, you guys take the time. You're very worried about what you write, how it comes across, how it's portrayed, all sorts of things. Like, you know, I worry so much. Everything is revolved around the basketball part mm-hmm. that you, these, it's so easy to get centered, self-centered around that. And it's like all about basketball, but I, I don't know. It, it's weird. The breakdown that we can give to like media members and like dehumanize them. Yes. And just put them into literal, just put them into words. And it's like, I never, I don't know. You just, if you open yourself up and you don't treat them like that, like they aren't going to be that you sometimes you make the person exactly who you want them to be. And I think that's a, that's a big, big problem. Yeah. I mean, that goes, it's probably across multiple <laughs> uh, platforms in terms of coverage and everything outside of sports and things like that, you know, how, um, how people are viewed and it's the same thing, but uh, plenty of sports writers and fans do the same thing to the athletes where they just look at them like video game characters and it's yeah. just, you know, it's stat sheets and that's it. And what they see on TV and they can say things that they want and they can say it without any level of accountability, whatever it may be. Like, oh, I might say something about the way you play, Stu, but then I'm going to be there, you know, standing in the – uh, post-game press conference area, you know, whatever. And I'll go wa- right up to you, you know, and make sure that, you know, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. You know what I mean? And yeah. what, what say you, what's your response to that? Um, as opposed to, you know, there's plenty of people who just like to just say what they want and don't actually show up to anything. Yeah. Don't actually ask any questions, you know, like, you know, it's, it's it's a fine line on you ever, you ever on all that holding back on on some criticism before maybe with a certain kid or like yeah, it, it's interesting that, with but... the college aspect right yeah like, that's that is part of it and like i've wondered if i've done college so long like how i would even do if i went to the nba mm. because i do feel like to a degree you give a certain level of leeway because you're not going to slam them right like yeah I'm not every game. Like, I'm not every game. Just going to blast Brandon Johns because Brandon Johns just isn't like it's just not clicking, right? Like something's just not there. And but it could happen at any time because that's college basketball. That DJ Wilson, you know, you could have picked him apart. And what's wrong with this guy? What's wrong with this guy? What's wrong with this guy? Then he has the two week stretch, and now he's an NBA player, right? Like, and so much of it is, you know, you're, they're 19 years old, and the pressure that is there from home, from their friends, from on campus to the coaching staff, to a television camera, to some guy like me coming up and asking them, you know, brilliant questions all the time. Um, Like there is, I feel like if you're not coming at it with a place of not compassion, but understanding that, this is a guy that, you know, is doing, attempting to do something at 19 years old that I couldn't fathom. Um, and, you know, maybe before just ripping him, like you can criticize. Yeah. yeah. Guy had a shitty shooting night, whatever. But like, you know, sometimes you just, I don't feel like I ever really cross a line and ever, certainly never making anything personal or making fun of somebody, but like um, I'll put it this way. One example I point out is like last year, I thought a lot of people crossed the line with Foster Lawyer at Michigan State in the way that they talked about him. I mean, other adults, where it was just people making fun of him, right? Yeah. And I'm like, that I don't, I don't get that, right? You can say a guy's struggling. You can say maybe this guy's a little over his head, level of play that he's at, whatever. But there were like, there were people going out of their way to make fun of this guy. Yeah. And I'm like, what's the line here, people? Like, is that, that's not cool, man. Like, it doesn't make sense. It's completely unnecessary. And, um, did you yeah. see that first hand, how that affected him? I don't know. I mean, Foster's a pretty close, you know, he doesn't really kind of talk that way. Um, uh-huh. he, you know, he's, he, his dad's a, was an NBA coach. Like, yeah, you know, he grew up around professional basketball. So Foster can take it, I, I think. And, 
Um, I don't even know. For all I know, he could be un- completely unaware of it and is isolated from it, but I doubt it. Um, and that yeah. doesn't make it right either way. Yeah, there's definitely a fine line. I think I'd even find myself – I don't want to, like, pat myself in the back too much, but <laughs> things where you can be like – I could talk about, you know, a certain teammate. And it's like, well, it, it wouldn't even be that bad. It'd be like something honest in the game. And I'd be like, well, he doesn't need that right now. Like, <laughs> we'll keep that in-house. I won't, mm-hmm. I won't be that honest. Um, yeah, it, it's a very interesting perspective when you get to 18 and 19-year-old kids, especially. I mean, once you've been in a few years, I feel like, okay, you got to – you got a kid, you know, is going pro. They're going to got to get used to it. They've been in the spotlight enough. Uh, right. People, kids get used to it. But there is definitely a fine line where I don't know. I don't, I don't know what is right in terms of media exposure and, you know, how much time that they have to give of themselves. I mean, I guess that's why they just teach us to shut it all down because mm-hmm. maybe they know. I mean, there, aren't there some coaches that – was it Coach K that wouldn't even let the freshmen talk? I think that's right. I think that's yeah. right. But they also have like an open locker room policy. So it's like, they're all kinds of backwards, like nothing like upside down world down there right? where it's like, you have open locker rooms, but like freshmen couldn't talk or there was something crazy like that. Uh-huh. Um, Cause like, you know, Michigan state and a handful of others are the only places that have open locker rooms now, which I don't really understand. Cause I don't see how that really prepares you for the pros. And um, I feel like guys are, I get that, the, you know, this idea that it's some kind of like Holy land, but um, you know, I feel like it's preparing guys for certain things. Um, I have a biased opinion though on, <laughs> on open locker rooms. So you might not have agreed. Um, but what's yeah. your take on open locker rooms? I think every other locker room should be open. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just post game, right? It's a cool, you get a cool down period and then you just hang out in there and we just come in and, you know, it's not like we're like in there when coaches are still talking and stuff like that. It's NBA style, right? You do your post game, hang out for 10 minutes, media comes in, ask you questions, as opposed to you kind of being paraded up in front of um, the, the you know, four corners of the little media room like that Michigan has it set up now. But so um, Michigan doesn't have, they don't have that now? No, there's no open I locker I swear we had that when I was there. Might have. I oh. mean, hasn't been that way since I've been here. Um, for sure. Um, but I'll tell you what I like. Another thing that I've kind of been going back and forth with that I'd be curious what you think now is like, you know, we talk so much about what's the right, what's the right thing to do in terms of compensating collegiate athletes, especially at, at, at this level, right? And what's their level of responsibility of being a pro versus an amateur and blah, 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 blah. Um, and you know, where, where does media access fall in that conversation is something that like, I don't know what the right answer is, you know, like you take time out to do this. Um, but it's still like, it's like, it's more unpaid hours, man, you know, and it just, all <laughs> and it's yeah. not just, you know, dealing with guys like me, but it's also, you know, we got to send you up to do a photo shoot for BTN and we got to send you up to do this and you're, you got to do that and you got to do that. And it's just like, man, it all adds up, you know, and if there could be some level of compensation, I'd say it would at least take out some level of the cognitive dissonance that it takes for me to be like, this is a normal way of doing business, yeah. right? It is amazing that they would always teach us about our brand, our brand, our brand. Uh-huh. Like you gotta take uh-huh. care of your brand, make sure it's pristine. And that was so Procter and Gamble could hire you after you graduated. But it's like, I'm 18. Like you tell me I can get charged for a, as an adult for a crime, but I can't have control of my identity right now just because uh-huh. there's no other place for me to go with basketball. You know, the arguments that people give for not giving kids their identity and their likeness and control over that. I mean, you're just grasping at straws. It's ridiculous. Like, Oh, they could go to Europe or you don't have to play for the NCAA. And I'm like, dude, get the hell out of here. Like this is, this makes no (laughs) sense why it's funny too. the people that were the talking points come from where it's, it's very much comes from people who are about um, capitalism and mm-hmm. letting the markets dictate price all, all those <laughs> fun talking points 
Uh-huh. But 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 I can't make money off my own name. I'm 18 years old. I'm an adult. Like, why can't I control that? Or why why do I have to sign that away? And yeah, that that is where I would start. Now, if you want to talk about revenue share with with schools, I can understand some some arguments, you know, about small schools, blah 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 blah. You know, these I really I honestly I do not care what other sports get funded. Like mm-hmm. if football and basketball are making money pay those kids that are making the money. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if rowing is not going to be a part of Michigan's athletic field. Like I really don't care. I don't see why that's a big deal. I mean, I understand the equality thing in title nine. I do understand those things that have to be kept up. Um, But I don't know you want to, you want to open it up in certain places and close it off in others. And it it really just doesn't make sense to me. And it's, it's sad to see it get squashed. It was sad to see the union, uh, that was trying to start up in Northwestern mm-hmm. and get squashed. I, I think that's exactly where it has to start. Um, I mean, I've seen the power of the union, the, the Euro League, the biggest basketball league sure. outside of the NBA, just got their union two years ago or three years ago, made a huge difference. I mean, the, these things, it's those talking points, I think that were, were you know, what, whatever years after the war about unions and mm-hmm. you had the battles with Teamsters and all this stuff. And I throw, uh, out, throw out some buzzwords, man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 exactly. So it's, I think it, I think it does start there. Um, how you do that, uh, you need some powerful pe- people to come in and, and be a voice. Mm-hmm. And I would, I know the NBA guys have a lot on their plate and the NFL guys have a lot on their plate. I would love to see someone that's really big and really right. influential, really trying to organize something. I think it's going to take that. I mean, I think eventually it'll happen, mm-hmm. but uh, it's going to take a lot. It, I, I, did not think that that Northwestern thing would get squashed that quick and then go from wherever it was back down to zero. I mean, that yep. was just beat to a pulp and then kind of blown away in the wind. And it was for sure. It was kind of weird to, to witness. So I think it's going to take a little more than just slow development. No, it looked like it had some headway and then it just kind of just didn't in like a snap. It felt like, um, and I know like for me, um, I wouldn't say shh struggle with it but like it's hard to believe that you know there should be compensation for for college athletes and meanwhile still just cover college basketball i make money i get paid yeah. right get paid handsomely i'm happy it's my life livelihood right yeah um all the guys i interview and hope and expect to answer my questions right don't get anything yeah. And you know what, you know, what's the, what's the fine line? Am, am, am I, am I just profiting off something I don't believe in? Right. Like it's, oh, it's, it's just the, this aspect of college sports that just is so strange and unlike anything else anywhere. Yeah. Um, like there's really no comparison to it. Um, just the structure of, of high level collegiate athletics. It just it doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, you know, like on one hand, um, I understand what they were going for, but sorry, it outgrew it. You know, it's kind of like gun loss, but believe it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we've already gotten into some second ter- or some interesting territories. I don't know if we need to touch on the Second Amendment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, maybe we'll save that for another podcast. Brandon and Stu do the Second Amendment. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting talk. It's interesting talk. Uh, I mean, I wrote about one time just the conversations around transfers. And now that's opened up, luckily. I mean, it's crazy. I I saw the the ruling this year that guys can just move freely. And I remember just any excuse that people can make for not letting kids transfer, particularly within conference. And I I think I wrote like 2,000 words or something, maybe even more about how it does not matter. Like you're just Mm -hmm. punishing these kids again for – looking for a better opportunity. And there's just, there's always some excuse. And I got tired of it. And to be honest with you, after four years, I was like, this was great. I love my experience. I learned a lot, but I am done with the system. It, it can really, really take it out of you, really drain you in certain aspects. And then you kind of look back and you're like, wait, where I put a bunch into this school. Like I did a lot of work. I hit some big shots. I won some mm-hmm. pretty big games. Can I see something like we live in a, we live in a world where money is extremely important 
and you're gonna sit here and tell me like, good job with your experience and here's your degree that really only a few of you took advantage of. Mm -hmm. Because like, I mean, school, I, I, it's, it's kind of odd the trade off there. Uh, I don't know, but it, it was definitely tiring. That, it, right. that is. And then you see the coaches salaries and you're just like, it's probably hard to really comprehend it when you're 18 and you're just happy to get your scholarship. And now you get, you know, your sweet ass gear and you're living in a nice place and you're tra taking charter flights and you're like, yeah, this is awesome. But then you're 25 and you're like, wait, what did he made? How much when I played those four years, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, can I, can I exchange my cool gift from the big 10 tournament for some cash? Like I would have really appreciated that. Right. Like, can I go right. back there? Like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they, they figure out some way to keep keep these guys down and so i don't know they'll keep doing it for a while <laughs> i would think so yeah but that i want to get into those who, who need to work too. yeah go for it <laughs> okay cool yeah i i watched the game against nebraska mm -hmm. and you know the penn state game left a lot to be desired um from the whole team i think that think they're still figuring a lot of things out with dickinson but you know, I was saying on the last podcast, you can win games if you keep the team to, what was it, 58 points, I think, Penn State. But you're not going to win the games you want if you're only scoring 62. I mean, what did you see the biggest difference between the Penn State game and the Nebraska game where they got into the 80s? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of it's style of play, I think, could probably the opponents, right? You know, Penn State plays a very different way than Nebraska. Nebraska is going to look to uh, – I wouldn't say uh, defense is a priority – <laughs> for nebraska yeah. it's uh yeah. you know there's going to take some wild ass shots hope they go in and, and look to suck it, yeah yeah man look to get into a game and hope to make shots and um that's kind of the way that they play this this penn state team is you know they they can score points they they've got the guard they got guards who can put the ball in the hoop but you know they can play a a, a kind of grinding style and things like that um the thing that's in terms of this kind of early season, especially these last few weeks, that's really jumping out to me in terms of what Michigan's doing is it's, it's an interesting scenario where you suddenly find yourself in season learning what your best option is and then having to kind of rearrange priorities like you know, when you think of how Michigan played in recent years with everything revolving around Xavier Simpson, well, okay, now you have a true post center mm -hmm. who needs touches on the blocks and is just, you know, needs to be a volume shooter and scorer and you have to get him the ball. You have to play through a center. This is like, it's like 1985. It's crazy. Um, and you, right, you don't just not just going to snap your fingers and suddenly you, everyone knows how to play that way so I feel like they've realized holy shit Dickinson's a monster you have to play this way but now all these other guys who've known a certain way of doing things have to recalibrate and you can see like I think Franz is a good example of trying to figure out how to play as kind of an auxiliary part to what is something very different when you know Xavier was just drilling him in the chest with perfect passes all the time right. last year and then he just went and got buckets right yeah um well that does you know Mike Smith isn't Xavier Simpson and yeah. Hunter Dickinson isn't John Teske so um you know I don't know how, coming into this year I don't know how much it was like priority you know we're just tossing it down low all game and and getting shots that was not the conversation, right? It was the wings. And now you have to figure out and adjust as you go. So there's going to be some hiccups. I'm, I'm sure they're going to have just, you know, a bad game here and there where the offense is just going to stagnate and defenses are going to defend them in different ways or Hunter Dickinson's going to get in early foul trouble. And now they're going to have to figure out how to do it a different way. But um, Dickinson, for as good as he is, I feel like has also reshuffled the deck in a way that it's going to take a minute and you're going to see very different showings every night. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny to watch. You know, Dickinson, I didn't even take a shot until well into the first half because uh, they were double teaming him and how teams are going to adjust to that. And I was just watching the guys in the perimeter, just like kind of like looking at Dickinson, like seeing the double team. They're like, well, do I move? Like, where do I go? <laughs> and I think Eli was the first one to like really do, you know, start to cut. I think that it's figured out as the game went on. Um, but I mean, there was like one time where Franz threw it in and he like kind of cut like real half-assed like didn't know and then like 
livers kind of like followed around to like the strong side and like got a shot out of it, but like they didn't even try very hard. They like didn't quite know. It's like, just move. Like you'll figure it out. You guys are smart enough. Just keep it going. But I, I want to talk to you about Franz because mm -hmm. I has just been dying for him to shoot the ball. And, and I read your, <laughs> you know, sort of heavy quotes profile that we talked about, you can't do mm -hmm. anymore. And it was talking about, mm -hmm. you know, should we be concerned about Franz? And you, and you said, mm -hmm. even before the Nebraska game, no, I'm not going to be too concerned right now. And then he had an interesting quote in there that said, I have to be more aggressive, but that doesn't mean taking more shots. And I, I was like, yeah, it does, dude. Like, it definitely does. Like, you just take more shots, and that'll open up the other parts that you want to do. It'll open up the team playing aspect that you want to be a part of. And But I'm like, dude, you're 6'10". You got to just shoot it. Like, it does not matter. And right. then go from there. Like, you already started out a little bit. I don't know if it was timid or just figuring things out. I mean, I, I, don't, I wouldn't call him timid. But, you know, slowly getting into things. And, right, it's only been six games. But, like, dude, just shoot it. I kind of I wondered if that quote was almost Franz telling himself that, you know, yeah. like because he probably has so many people from the staff to his brother to whoever being like, dude, just let like just let it happen. Like the game, you know, when the ball when you find the ball in your hands, just go make a play. You know, him coming out and saying, I have to shoot more, will will I don't know that's could potentially lead to taking bad shots, right? You don't just want to shoot just for the sake of having more field goal attempts. Like you want to shoot because you're getting yourself into position to get good looks. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I kind of felt like I had the same reaction you did where what do you have the game before that? He had like five shot attempts and you're like, dude, oh, you're yeah. the, probably the best player on the team. <laughs> like that yeah. just doesn't, you know, yeah, Dickerson might be the most dominant player on the team, but you're the most best. You might probably the best basketball player on the team. But yeah, like, I don't know how black and white that line was. You know what I mean? That yeah. that quote. I, I think some of it. He doesn't. He's measured. He's not going to put more pressure on himself than needs to be. It's it's always going to be. You know, I'm going to play my game. You know, and some games it's going to be a lot of shots. Some games it isn't. I did find it interesting that Isaiah Livers basically called it. That yeah. do you see that? You know, he said you're gonna like you're gonna see who he is. It. Yeah, like <laughs> like Juwan came out and like they like they watched film and you know, I, I imagine because Beeline would do the same thing with guys where you know Tim or Trey wouldn't take a shot mm -hmm. and you know have like a rough game, maybe only take like six, seven shots when he didn't take 10, 11, 12. And I'm I mean, I can only imagine that Juwan stopped the film and was like, dude, shoot this. Just shoot mm -hmm. this one, shoot this one. There's probably countless times i mean he only shot 12 threes i think in the first five games and i was watching some couple games like just put it up no one's gonna block you who cares just right. shoot it. right and I, I i bet they had that conversation huh interesting yeah yeah i mean he knows i feel like he does have a pretty solid understanding of how good he is yeah um he seems so and i don't know he seems very mm -hmm. similar, like where he, I think he really did mean it. Like, it were, or when Joan was talking about him figuring everything out, where, like you said, and you wrote it in the, in the piece where it was going from Xavier to this and like really figuring it out. And it takes, I mean, there's no non conference schedule. Like, it was nothing. There was no figuring out in the preseason. Right. It does take a while to figure this stuff out. I mean, I've had seasons where, you know, we had, I think it was my junior year, we started out like, oh, and six or something in the Big Ten. And then we ended up making the tournament. And it's like, you can figure it out in the last 10 games. Like, it right. didn't take a long time, but I remember I just watched a couple plays where he came off a screen, a guy went under, came off the ball screen, a guy went under, and he didn't shoot it, and and that pissed me off. And then and then he came back literally like three plays later, and then shot it when the guy went under and he made it. Then there was another possession. He drove down the lane, he missed a tough shot, kind of a little runner, a little outside the lane over outstretched arms, missed it, came back I think like two plays later, did the exact same thing and, and made that one. So right. I was like, okay, he's. He's figuring it out, figuring out his spots, where he needs to go. Like, he seems maybe too smart. Like, sometimes he's overthinking his talent a lot of times. Yeah, and, and how many times has there been where the ball would maybe be, get swung over to him and he would go on that, you know, instinctually to put the ball on the deck and, and drive down, um, make like a baseline drive or whatever, where last year, right, John Teske might be standing at the foul line. 
There's nobody under the basket. All you got to do is beat your man. Well, now yeah. Hunter Dickinson's standing under the basket, which means that the guy who's guarding Hunter Dickinson is also standing under the basket, right? And right. Uh, it's just that space is so much different. You need to, right? I mean, you, you could probably explain it way better than I could. Like, understand how your offense looks and, like, where those lanes are and where the opportunities are. And getting that feel, like, how how long over the course of a season do you feel like it takes for that to develop? It's not the NBA where it's 82 games, right? You have a bunch more finite amount of time. Like, how long does that take? It can take a bit. I mean, we our offense has kind of got once once Darius Morris got to got to helm the point guard spot, it really became a ball screen offense. And then with Trey, it was the exact same things. And, and we ran our set offense, and we had our we had our designated spaces and our designated times to drive. And you know, Tim can drive off the wing when this happens. And you know, he was given leeway kind of within a box. Like, you, you know, sure. Eli would literally tape off courts into thirds. And it was like, this mm-hmm. is central. This is right. This is left. You know, you want to start the offense and, and central this possession. So there was literally like broken down into spaces. And I think when I watched Nebraska game, like Howard had them four out one in and kind of got made sure that spacing was going, but then still had, you know, it's not, it's not an intricate, offense it is basically where okay we need to figure out how to get these guys into spots and then let their talent take over like for Mm -hmm. us with beeline it was always you got to be in the spot and then you have a short window to let your talent take over um Mm. you know there's a lot of times you know maybe rightfully so but there's a lot of times i wanted to do some stuff and i was like i can't do it right now because i'm not allowed to do it in this spot in this time (laughs) and like you know that stuff happens Trey, definitely all you know the guys with talent they get more leeway and definitely you know the 13th Mm -hmm. team had those things but um, ours is a little more set. So I think it, it's a little more of adjustment when you have the talent that you have the Dickinson's, you have the, the livers and the, and the Wagner's, and then you guys, the supplemental guys. Um, I, I think it's, it will take more time for a team like this compared to a team like I had it under B line. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think overall though, I mean, I like this team's upside a ton um, yeah. between offensive versatility, the different bodies they have, the shooters they have. Um, they can beat you a different way every night. Got some depth. You know, when you look around this league, it's, you know, everyone's talking, everyone's going to, you know, destroy each other. And that's true. But yeah. like, you just need to be a team that can, find like I like the fact that they can find different ways to beat teams because if you're reliant on one or two things this league is so good the coaching is so good the scouting so good where like it's just gonna be really hard to win I mean, it's so old there's so much experienced teams and things like that but you know, the fact that Michigan can go and get it from different bodies each night have a guy like Shawnee Brown come off the bench who we don't even mention like yeah they got a lot going for them when you, I, I think, it match is, them up across the league. Yeah, the, the irony of it is they set themselves up for bad games because you have to give guys with talent the leeway. And mm-hmm. you know, one night, not all, maybe all of them will just be off and they'll get blown out. I don't know, sure. like twenty by who cares? Uh, mm-hmm. An unranked team, like you have to, and then people will overreact to it. But it's like, no, you have to, you have to give those guys that type of leeway. I'm with my teams. It was everything was more precise, so it was keeping a low score and keeping it close, cut down turnovers, everything is more precise. We're going to keep it very inside of a box. And you have to open up that box with these types of teams. Like that's, what's going to win you championships. I think maybe that 18 team was a little different, but they had not really, cause they had the NBA talent. So, you know, those similar yeah. things under B line. I think it's the similar, be similar things under Howard, but I, I do want to ask you about Sean D and, and mm-hmm. why is he only playing 20 minutes and like, Am I crazy to think that he deserves more? I mean, if you look at his minutes, you know, his on, um, on court, off court differences, like he's as good as anyone on the team in terms of his production and defense. You know, it's yeah. they're better on offense when he's on the court, they're better on defense when he's on the court. It's hard to ignore. Um, but then the problem's like, where are the minutes coming from? Right. Yeah. Like, we just we just sat here talking about Franz. You taking those minutes from Franz, Isaiah Livers? Like, what's he playing right now? Um, let's see. So 
Yeah, I mean, he played 37 minutes against Nebraska. He played 35 minutes against Penn State. That probably is a touch high, no? I feel like 32 minutes maybe for Isaiah, right? Um, That that can give Shawnee Brown some more time right there. Um, But it's hard because do you want Terrence Williams to play? I want to see Terrence Williams play. You know, yeah. I like what he gives him off the bench, especially when things go a little sideways. He at least comes in there and just kind of just makes shit happen. That's better than nothing. And in those games where you get a little stagnant stretch, they already proved it. Like he's he's kind of forced their hands. And, um, yeah. you know, yeah, he does some stuff where he's a freshman, clearly. But, you know, I don't – I want him to stay – if I'm the staff, I want him to stay engaged. So – Yes, I'm going to I'm going to make sure. Right. Even if it's three minutes a half, you you got to get him out there just so that he's sitting on the bench watching the game a certain way. Right. Yeah. Um, and and then Brandon Johns. Well, OK, well, you know, now you get Brandon on the court because he has to be your your backup five. But right. you know, when if or when Austin comes back, what do you do there? Um, they got to try to keep unlocking him. Right. You have yeah. to keep trying to figure out Brandon. So. All those bodies, I don't. I, I don't saw know. I saw thirty two minutes. I think each from Eli and and Smith, and I was like, you know, take three from there. Like uh-huh. play Sean D at the two. I mean, he's he's just so engaged when he's in the game, and I think he's very versatile where he can play. And he's so hungry as a fifth year senior to prove himself. Yeah, that he is gonna be locked in, and you don't want to lose that from a guy like that because. That is so crucial when you get into – you're going to get into the deep part of this Big Ten schedule and it's, they're going to be tired of the pandemic and not seeing anybody. And you need a guy that's, like, hungry all the time. And if you even lose that edge a little bit, I think it could be – I mean, I don't want to go, like, like it's going to be a massive problem, but, like, it's very important. I've seen it over time and time again. Like, you need those guys that are just going to step up no matter what. Um, and he's talented too. Like he's got the confidence. I, I, I saw the quote in your piece where he was saying like, we could be starters or star players and other teams, but we want to be part of a winning team. Right. I was like, damn. Okay. So there's, there's a little <laughs> bit there where you're like, okay, that's a little agitation and that's fine. Honestly, I would, that's what I would want out of a guy like that. He thinks he's better than where he is and he's going to prove it to other people, but that's, you're walking a fine line with a guy like that. If you're going to only play him 20 minutes and he's going to keep producing the way he is, he's shooting 40%. Like if he's going to keep doing that and you're going to keep, you know, not show him the, the time that he deserves. It's it's, I do not envy Howard. Let's put it that way in terms right. of uh, time and, and how many minutes. Yeah. Him. I mean, it's a good, it's a good problem to have, but you're right. I mean, yeah. it's what 13 points and 14 minutes against, or no, he had a little bit more of that, like 15 or 16 minutes, something like that against Nebraska. Um, yeah, I mean, he gets out and there is no – there's no pause. There's no, like, adjustment period. Like, he gets on the court, he's already going to be one of your best defenders and he's already going to look to make shots and take threes yep. and do all this stuff. And, um, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I really hadn't considered – I wonder if, if if it's because it's December, late December, early conference play, and little by little, right – Okay, you cut down this minute, you cut down that minute, you say, and suddenly by with 10 games left in league play, you have a tight seven, eight man rotation, right? Yeah. And now yep. Shawnee Browns is playing 26 minutes, and but those other guys have experience and things like that. You know, maybe that's the case. Um, because Although, I mean, he's a first year player here too. Like he, he yeah. needs an experience playing with these guys just as much as anyone else there. Right. It's a really interesting makeup, isn't it? Like this, it's this crazy. group that's like so old, but then also still all getting to know each other. Um, I think it's yeah. been a really impressive job by the staff. The fact that, that they've really kind of weathered some really awkward periods and, you know, yeah, they look bad at some times, but. Seven and zero. Oh, a lot of teams have had their oh, cut kind of at the knees moments, <laughs> moments of like, oh yeah, it's COVID. They didn't practice all summer, and yep. their off season workouts were shit. And now you just saw the product of it. And yep. Michigan at least found the way to win all those games. Right. What have you seen? Is there a difference that you've seen from Howard from the first year to the second year in terms of coaching style adjustments? Like you know, is the pandemic 
Is it like just throwing all the evaluations out the window or, or what's going on? Yeah. With that? I mean, it's, that's the thing. Like, I mean, I talk to people on the program and stuff like that. And I mean, really it's just the heat, you know, they just try to be a college version of the heat. And yeah. It's in every way, in the way that they are, are game planning going into each game from, you know, they have their call sheets, right. And they, they're, we're running this play against this team and these are what we're doing and blah, blah. It's the same thing that the heat do, right. It's the same kind of culture. It's the same level of, um, you know, it's not be line where every minute of your day is accounted for. And there is a level of personal responsibility that you are afforded. Um, yeah. And I haven't heard of anything dramatically different of um, that they're doing year over year where it's, you know, I, I feel like for him, the biggest difference is, and this is based on more, off-season conversations with with Juwan um like he personally has some differences in terms of his time management and things like that because those were things that he talked about in the off-season of that he just really wasn't prepared for in year one was yeah how to organize your schedule how to do this how to do that and um you know, he's going through a thing right now, right? His mentor just died. And last year, his cousin, who he was born and raised with, passed away midseason. And, you know, he had, to, he had to maneuver through that and going back and forth from Chicago and making arrangements and things like that. And all these things that you just can't plan for in a season. And when you're the head coach and it's you make every decision and everyone's looking at you constantly, like yeah. those are the things that I feel like you'd maybe be see some differences in, in how he's doing things in year two versus year one, but how they're operating as a program, I, I could be completely wrong, but in terms of what I've been told, you know, there isn't anything that dramatically different. Yeah. I was talking to a uh, Bakari Alexander. He's coaching mm-hmm. at Denver. Sure. And he, he was my coach at, at Michigan. One of my favorite guys in the world. And he's like, yeah, the pandemic's great. I don't do any recruiting and it's just basketball. And I was like, yeah, we were talking about, you know, getting into college coaching and he's like, okay, make sure you know exactly what you're getting into. And, and, and you know, it reminds me of Juwan and everything. And, and I, he knew what he was getting into, but even then you have to experience it. And I think the pandemic, you know, throws even that into, throws a wrench into that. Uh, but I think in a good way, we're like, these guys can just stick to basketball and don't have to worry about too much outside. You know, there's no campus appearances. There's mm-hmm. no team activities. Like, what are we going to do on the court today? And Absolutely. It's pretty simple. And, and I, I just, I don't know, it feels like a guy like Juwan would kind of thrive on that because that's kind of the NBA environment. But, and I also feel like in, in terms of recruiting in the pandemic, you know, there's, there's an echelon of coaches who can probably take a little bit of advantage of this, right? Where it's your name is this massive drawing power. And it's not just like, you know, those programs are just like, we're just going to outwork everyone, right? In recruiting, yeah. we're just going to outwork everyone on the recruiting trail and do this and do that. Well, no, you're not. Not right now because everyone's in the same boat, basically. Yeah. The difference is, you know, everyone's going to pick up Juwan Howard's phone call. <laughs> Every kid in America is picking up that phone, you know? And dad is talking about it afterwards, yeah. Yeah, and if you're going head-to-head against – Ohio State for a recruit, right? And Jawan Howard calls you, and then Chris Holtman calls you. Yeah, that kid is going to call Jawan Howard back first. Sorry, you know Chris. what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's just the way it is. Like, it goes back to that original conversation. Like, he's just so stupid famous that it's it's crazy. So, um, you know, the fact that that he does uh, work as hard as he does in recruiting and just constantly on the phones and kind of constantly working his channels and all that stuff. They can, they can really uh, use this time probably to their benefit. As messed up as that sounds. <laughs> yeah, no, that is that is for sure, and it's seemed to be working lately. That it is, does. That is one thing. <laughs> um, you cover obviously both Michigan and Michigan State, so I want to give the Michigan li- listeners a little bit of uh, injection of Schadenfreude. So, can you give a little quick description of what the hell is going on with Michigan State? Oh, God. and <laughs> what their deal is. Okay. This is a whole different podcast. We could talk for another hour. I know. Um, right? Yeah. I mean, 
you know, coming into the year, the biggest question was at the point guard position and at center, and obviously replacing Cassius Winston and replacing Xavier Tillman. Um, and now it's December 29th, mm-hmm. and not only are both positions not f- figured out, but both positions, you could argue, are even bigger question marks than they were six weeks ago. That's right. And between, yeah. between that and this group um, being offensively without, it seems like, natural playmaking, go get buckets, go score with confidence, go after teams, play like we are used to Michigan, seeing Michigan State play, is lacking offensively. The uh, stat I put out there in the story today, Rocket Watts hasn't taken a free throw since December 4th against Detroit Mercy. Aaron Henry has taken eight free throws in Big Ten play. Joshua Lankford has not attempted a free throw in three Big Ten games. Um, All three of them are shooting 30% on twos and 30% on threes. Um, (laughs) When when your primary... Yeah, playmakers are playing that way. It's impossible. There's just no chance of winning. And defensively, not only do you not just replace Xavier Tillman, but you you can't replace everything that he did. And it's from being the voice back there to directing everyone to being a safety net to making everyone else a better defender. Um, not only is that gone, but I think personnel wise we might have thought Michigan State to be probably better than they are in -hmm. fact as as defenders and that's probably outside of Aaron Henry who probably does have the upside but his offense is so bad right now it's probably impacting his defense because the guy's just in his own head Um, and maybe Rocket Watts isn't quite as good as people thought defensively Joshua Langford is not who he was two years ago no fault of his own but that's just kind of the way it is right and then the five possession is a mess so how are you going to guard ball screens when your center is this rotating, revolving door, right? Yeah. So both sides of the floor are a mess. And the team, the team's confidence, the team's identity, whatever, all of it right now is just up in the air. And I have no idea if this right here is just a cataclysmic slump, right? And the team is way better than... They are playing, and suddenly shots are going to start falling. And, you know, yeah. it, might, it might not look like a top-10 team in the country, right? But it might not look compl- like a complete mess like it has. Um, for sure. So what's, like, what's, for me, the question is, is this just a total outlier of a disastrous slump of play? Or is this team, like, mediocre to not good? which means you're ninth, 10th in the Big Ten, and yeah. you are a 10 or 11 seed in the NCAA tournament, right? Yeah. Like, are they – can they be the fifth or sixth best team in the Big Ten? Because they're not going to compete for a Big Ten championship. Right. But can they be the fifth or sixth best team in the Big Ten, or are they going to be the 10th or 11th in that sl- – you know what I mean? Like, yeah. where is that? I don't know. And you don't want to – you overreact with a pro with a team coached by Tom Izzo and you end up looking like an idiot two weeks later. Right. Yeah, exactly. The way it is. Um, but like the things that you're just seeing right now, it's just so jarring to watch a Michigan state team play this way that, you know, you try to be measured, but it's hard not to just, yeah. Like the walls are crumbling down. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I never doubt uh, Izzo team. It almost feels like, he knows exactly what he's doing with, with mm. his team right now. Uh, but, yeah, that is definitely music to Michigan fans' ears. I mean, that was a lot. I was expecting <laughs> – I was, was maybe like two, three things, and you're like, well, the foundation's gone, guys. I don't know. Was... <laughs> but um, It's all fresh on the head. I recorded my podcast with Dylan earlier today, and we talked, right. I think, about Michigan State for like an hour and 15 minutes, and I wrote a column on them last night, and I was on Jack Ebling's show, and – Lansing today, and yeah, it's been a lot of Michigan State today. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So you know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I haven't uh, written a word a today, so questions. that's a very productive day. What'd you say? Yeah, <laughs> a couple more questions, and then yeah. uh, 
we'll, we'll get you out of here. Um, you cover, you've covered the PGA. You, you covered yep. it for how, how long now? This past summer was my second summer covering it. Okay. Well, okay. Two questions. Mm -hmm. Favorite course that, you know, maybe nobody really talks about. And then I mm -hmm. want you to give me a one bold PGA major prediction for, for this upcoming season. Oh, okay. Um, so I mean, so I haven't done like a full circuit on tour, like going to sure. 30 events or anything crazy uh -huh. like that. Um, the best places I've been to are Pebble Beach, Augusta National, Winged Foot, and Beth Page. I mean, yeah, you just pretty good list. Yeah, pretty, pretty good, good list. list. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I will say that man, it's tough. So I got to I got to play Beth Page the day after the PGA Championship oh, in nineteen. So that was the Brooks Kepka year where he and DJ went. Things got crazy on the back nine on Sunday, and it was just wild. Um, but I got to play the course the next day in the same condition. So they didn't touch the rough. They rolled the greens I think that morning, but they kept the Sunday pin placements, and uh, it, it was. It was so preposterous <laughs> hitting into these fairways because it was just one roll, like one revolution of the ball, the fairway, oh. and you're in three inches of rough. Um, yeah. And that playing that, like it'll always kind of hold a special place for me because like playing that gave me a very different understanding of what these guys actually do. Where like I don't, I'm not bad. I'm like at my best in the middle of summer. I'm like an eight handicap. Um, and you play a situation like that and realize that not only do they hit the ball a different way, like they play the, the court, a different course than we do, even when we're yeah. still on it. Yeah. Right. Like if I'm on the fair, if I roll off the fairway, you know, and I'm on a long par four and I basically have to hit a pitching wedge out because I can't, I can't sweep a six iron through. Like I can't even make contact with the ball <laughs> to make a shot at the green. Like you're just playing a different sport at that point, you know, right. where Brooks is just muscling a nine iron into the, into the green and I'm laying up with a pitching wedge. It's just wild. Right. And then you get up on the greens and obviously that's just a whole mess. Oh, but man. uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that I got to do that was a, uh, what'd you shoot? Great. 94. Okay. Yeah, I was happy with it. I wanted to break 100. Now, if I didn't have a caddy with me, I probably yeah. wouldn't have broken yeah. 100. But but he not only found my he not only found the tee shots that were in the rough. Cuz yeah. literally, I mean, you could be 5 yards off the rough and not be able to find it. Yeah, 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 I bet. So so the caddy found all those balls and he also didn't let me hit certain shots, right? So if I'd be in the rough and be like, I'm going to pull this hybrid out and try to put one, no, you know, 180 not. yards on the green. <laughs> Just punch it out in the fairway. Just t let's just for, for playing for bogey, my man. Yeah, I think it's it's cheating. Like, how many times you hit a shot and you're like, all right, it's a little off the rough, and then you can't find it. PGA, it's just like ah, the fan, the the, the crowd is just right there pointing at it. Like, yeah, and that was wild about Wingfoot. My life is just because there was no crowd at Wingfoot, so nothing. No one um, was walking on the deep rough all day. Yeah, that too. So you know, you'd have guys just hitting it offline. And it was just gone. Just couldn't find it because the rough was too high and there weren't spectators out there. That's I think great. that's how, unless that ball stayed in the tree, I think that's how Jordan Spieth lost his first tee shot of the tournament. Yeah. He just, he just air mail, or I think it was the second hole, second hole, um, put one down the right side, hit the top of the trees and they just never found it. Um, you know, that's on a regular day, someone would have probably hit someone in the head. <laughs> probably. All right. Give me, give me a bold, uh, bold prediction. I am taking, Matthew Wolf in Augusta. Ooh. Ooh, damn. Let's go. That is big. How about my guy Hideki? What are we, what are we feeling? I love Hideki, man. I, uh, I, I spent a day with him last year, and it was, it was fascinating. I spent it with uh, his whole media contingent, right? Mm. And it's like at these events, you have Hideki's media, and then you have everyone else's media. Huh. So I, I spent a day uh, with them and – 
kind of wrote about what was a very quiet summer because he was just kind of right on the borderline of being in contention, but never really was. But his game was tight by the end of the year. Um, yeah. Looked ready to go. I, I could like, – he's going to win one soon. It's going to happen. It has to soon. happen. Yeah. He's – you know, the, the putting is just sometimes – unnerving right and i just worry he's got more than enough game but is he going to make putts in the fourth round of an open i don't know (laughs) i don't think yeah nobody's banking on that i just want him to he needs to be up by about six strokes i think needs to be up like yeah four or five six strokes preferably at a pga i feel like pg i feel like hideki's got a pga championship written all over him as his first yeah first major yeah, him and well, I love him. I mean, him and Paul Casey are very similar. Why do you love Hideki? Where'd that huh? come from? Why do you love Hideki? I think it's the the, the iron play and like mm-hmm. seeing him a few years ago. Just I think there was like one tournament that he won, and he was just hitting long irons just within ten feet, just like a machine. <laughs> and then he just kind of like nonchalantly puts his club down and just kind of, you know how he is. And, yeah. And it's I don't know, just something about him, like Dora and. The name helps. That's for sure. He's just mm-hmm. a very unique guy. And and the talent's always there. I think I kind of relate to him a little bit because the, the talent is there without the success. Um, that you <laughs> Is would. that how you describe yourself? <laughs> well, for me, <laughs> nobody else would describe it that way, but that's not how I would describe myself. <laughs> you got to stay a little delusional, okay, when you play basketball. You got to get a little bit of delusion to keep yourself going. Um <laughs> But I don't know. It was just always the talent. I just thought what was at his peak was always up there with, with the rest of them. So well, he's still that. only like, he's like 25. That's what's crazy. It's like, think, yeah. I think I've been like wanting to win so bad that I think he's 30 now. And I'm like, no, mm-hmm. he's not. He's just super young. He's got plenty of time. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, he works on his game so hard. It's just crazy. Um, and like when I, that day I spent with him, I didn't realize it, but you know, in the off season, he goes home when everyone like takes their time off, he goes home, fulfills all of his sponsorship uh, responsibilities. Like that dude works like 13 months a year, you know, and, and he's just making, I don't know how many more, how many players on the tour make more money than that dude does, even without him winning a major or winning that often, frankly, at this point, like the sponsorship money that he has overseas is outrageous. I, I mean, I've read, stories about you know asian tennis players that just mm-hmm. have an ungodly amount of money and you're like wait do five percent of the world even know this person's name like <laughs> yeah. what is going on here and i i've heard about the the responsibilities that they have and you see like the nba guys go over to china and do all their responsibilities and how much that takes and and i mean i feel like it's an exhausting trip for them but it's like a guy like a deck he's got to go back and yeah it's non-stop and work on your game and keep everything mentally sharp. Try and have a life outside of that. Like, But like he got married with no one knowing it. Remember that when that happened, he just like came back. He's like, oh yeah, I'm married now. And like, that's what I love. No, no one had any good. idea. He, his wife's back home. He's never there. Uh, yeah. He like lived with his caddy through the, through the early stages of the pandemic, just at his house in Florida. Uh, how's your game? No, I'm uh, garbage. I think I've played only a few times this year. I need to get fitted, Brandon. I, I just I have to get fitted for clubs. Got to have. How tall are you? Six three. Okay. Yeah. And, and I got to get fitted, and I don't. I don't even know what, like, what my swing looks like. Like, I don't even know. I'm trying to, trying to figure it out. Like, I, I tried to reshape it. I'm like, all right. And this is influencing the worst golfers in the world now. But you see these guys hitting. I'm like, I want to play crooked stick. I don't know if you've been to crooked stick and caramel. And it's like, I want to play crooked stick with my friends and I want to be able to hit a 300 yard drive. Like consistently, I want to get the whip action. So I'm like, mentally I'll sit over in Israel and like take a broomstick and I'm like working on my whip and working on my hips. And I'm like, I suck. What am I doing? I don't know, but it's, you know, it's going to be the thing. I would say I'd be fairly confident if you put in the work, you could hit 300 yard drives. If you're six, three, you're in shape, right? Yeah. Like, well, and it's not, it's not a matter of how hard you swing. It's a matter of the club head speed you get, which isn't a matter of swinging hard. Right. You know, I go, you know, I got like the Tony Finau kind of shortened swing, but without any of the mechanics, <laughs> really power. So it's like, I told my buddy one time, I was like, yeah, like Tony and uh, 
guy, another guy on tour, like they got like the short and swings, and he's like, Yeah, Tony's wingspan is like six seven, bud. Like yeah, Finau's like six six. Yeah, you, you, you're you're not he even he can close. hit it as far as Bryson if he wants to. He's crazy. Yeah, he is crazy. Yes. I love watching. But then they're like him adding that level of distance doesn't make any sense because how like if you're hitting it 350, man, okay, that's probably not the thing that's holding you back from winning. So no, no, not for a guy like that, especially. But uh, all right, all right, a couple more questions. Well, this one comes yeah. from uh, our uh, our one and only Rob Doster, who says, oh, no. I have to ask you, uh, I, need a, I need a bar story. I need a bartending story before we get out of here. A bartending story. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> it's been a long time. I knew Rob was going to do that. I yep. probably should have thought of one beforehand. Um, yeah, I should I should have prepped you for that, but uh, that's oh, I got a good one. I got a okay. good one. Um, so when I was still in Philly, right now I was unemployed. I was probably like twenty nine or so, and uh, at this point I was just like freelancing for the Philadelphia Inquirer, freelancing for like Basketball Times, but like I was a shit show. Right, there was just nothing was happening. It was not good, and. Uh, my man, John Akers, who's the editor of Basketball Times, apparently, like, I don't know. I don't know if he entered me for this or whatever, but um, there's this the USBWA, United States Basketball Writers Association, has this thing. It's called, like, the Rising Star Award, right? For anyone who's under 30, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And uh, so I guess he entered me for it or whatever. But anyway, so I'm bartending one afternoon. I get in. I start my shift at 4 o'clock. You know, I'm still a smoker at the time, so I'm – you know, in the basement, smoking cigarettes, organizing the beer, whatever. And I bring up a, uh, I'm bringing up like three cases of beer and my phone rings. I put it down, check the phone. It's acres. I'm hoping that he's calling me with like a job offer from somebody or like has some contact. And he's just like, Hey, so, uh, I, th- I wanted to tell you, you're up for this, this award for like rising, whatever. And, uh, I'm like, Okay. Like, what does that mean? He's like, well, the other people who are up for it are, it's like a guy who worked for USA Today, a guy who worked for Sports Illustrated, a guy who worked for this or for that. And I'm like, hey, John, um, I mean, I hate to tell you that's a, that's a great honor, but like, I'm literally, I'm stocking a bar right now. You're calling me, trying to lift my spirits with this. I proceed to go in, I clock in. I just get blind drunk during this shift right i just spiral right i'm irish catholic this is what happens Uh i spiral into this self-loathing and (laughs) the whole thing and i think that was the night where uh i probably shouldn't tell the story publicly whatever um (laughs) i get a call the next day and they're like money drawer's gone man i'm like oh uh-oh. <laughs> what, what happened? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay. Uh, like, I don't have it. I'm sure it's there somewhere. They're like, did we get robbed? Blah, 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 blah. No, they, they just looked around and I just left it like on a shelf. Just like, no one will the, find it here. It's safe here. It's cool. <laughs> basically, by like the, like within eye view of the front door, the front yeah. window, the whole yeah. thing. I just left it there at the end of the night, right? Count the money check the thing, leave the drawer just sitting there and uh, get my job. <laughs> well, <laughs> that Which is good because it was my only job. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Funny how, how good news can uh, it really take so, you down those, those spirals. I was so pissed. <laughs> I was so pissed. <laughs> but, hey, it's worked out pretty well, I think. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Things things kind of found their way, which is yeah. always good. Um, of course, Rob. Rob's got some good stories. The problem is that Rob has a better memory than me. Like, Probably he's not. one of these dudes we've talked about. You know, like, I enjoy being a beat writer, right? And he's a national writer. And I'm like, I don't, I think I would suck as a national writer. I can't remember all these people. I can't remember names. Like, if you want me to remember the third best player on Kansas and Duke and North Carolina and UCLA and blah, blah, you know, like it's just, there's no way that I'm going to remember all that. I don't think it's healthy to be honest with you. I need to forget things. (laughs) Like I don't remember all this stuff. Novak could tell me stories like in great detail, like what happened to us in college. And I'm like, 
I have no idea what you're talking about, but it's like something I did like in a game mm-hmm. or like off camp, like, you know, off campus. I'm like, ah, eh, well, sure. But I have repressed all that stuff. No recollection. I like no. it. It's, it happens and then it's gone forever, yeah. preferably. Yeah. I think it's good. I think it's healthy. I think that's good for us. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Last one. Mm-hmm. We'll get you out of here. And right, maybe, maybe you have a different answer, but I think you've been in Ann Arbor enough. Although you might not have been to one of these places. Are you a scorekeepers guy or a Rick's guy? I have never been to either. Oh, well, okay. I can applaud that. You've never <laughs> even been to Rick's? I've never been to Rick's, no. I think walking into Skeeps now at, you know, after like 25 is probably not a good idea, but huh, that's interesting. You've never been to so Rick's. How do you cover I, Michigan and never been to Rick's? So I was over, I was, would have been 32 when I moved here. Uh, something like that um well you should see the characters that go into ricks and (laughs) and uh having you know i was in knoxville before and you know there's a pretty good separation of church and state there in terms of you know your college scene and your adult scene yep um and ann arbor i like that fact right i like that there's different sides of the tracks there of you know the college kids over there the adults are down there but I didn't go into those places because I was uh, you just want to avoid certain situations. Right. And uh, but the one time I went to the Brown jug. Oh boy. uh, With a couple buddies and we go in and uh, the, one of the first people I saw there was a member of the current, not current as in today, but current as in that time period, this Mm -hmm. was years ago, but a member of that year's Michigan team. (laughs) <laughs> and he That's made, an red flag. He made, <laughs> made eye contact and came, came over, said hello, and I was like, you know, I'm good. I'm good. I'm yeah, good. I'm good. <laughs> you stay, I'll leave. All right. Yeah. But we're not going to be here at the same time. And uh, that was it. I'm not going into any uh, any of the student. Uh, populated places yeah so i'd rather just stay out of sight out of mind thank you <laughs> yeah that's probably smart it reminds me of one time i'm back home and i don't know why i think i was still playing i don't remember exactly what it was but i was in kilroy's in broad ripple and sure. in, uh, walking to kilroy's and it's you know kilroy's relatively young bar you can get some mid-20s guys sometimes people in their 30s but i walk in and I see these three dudes and they're in their button downs. They're tucked into their, their pants. They got their belts on. I mean, cell phones, I think on the hip. Oh, clip. And I'm like looking at them and I'm like, oh, okay. Those are big 10 reps right there. And I walk over <laughs> and I, I like them. They're guys I liked. I went over and talked to them. They're like holding their drinks in like a little like tight huddle, the three of them. And like, you know, the whole rest of the world is walking around them. And I go up and talk to him. We have like a like nice five minute conversation, maybe a little less. Um, and then immediately, I think they like put their half drink drinks down. They're like, all right, we're, we're leaving. We got to get out of here. <laughs> we can't be in the same place. We paid 12 bucks for this Long Island iced tea, but I'm putting the rest of it down. There goes six bucks of waste. Isn't it hilarious seeing refs in civilian clothes? <laughs> it's jarring. It's pretty jarring. <laughs> Especially in like full dad mode too, where you're like, this isn't your scene, buddy, but I appreciate you trying. I once, uh, I think it might've been the Coralville Marriott or the, the official, one of the officials working the following day's game. It was New Year's Eve. Oh. Uh, and one of the officials working the, fo- the, working the following day's game was sitting there eating dinner by himself. I was, you know, at the end of the bar eating dinner by myself. I'm like, hey what's going on you know so we join in and then i think another person or two came and we ended up you know probably standing up far too late and we all had new year's eve together at mid <laughs> at midnight nice. and the next game was like i think it was an early game too it was noon i was like mm. if i were a gambling man i would probably figure out a way to make this uh work in my favor one way Fouls or under like he's not paying attention <laughs> exactly that's yeah, good. Take, take the under. There's not going to be late fouls because he's going to be looking no. to get the hell out of there. Hell no. That time, yeah, you're done. <laughs> well, man, I appreciate you coming on. We have to do this again sometime this during the year. Uh, it's always fun talking to you, so I really appreciate it. And 
you want to plug some pieces you know you, uh, you write for the athletic for michigan mason state your podcast yeah we, uh, we the two podcasts you would search are uh, the beat that's uh nick Baumgartner and i um for the athletic and then we have uh, colton pouncey and austin meek often join on that show to talk some football uh and then the moving screen is the podcast i do with dylan uh you subscribe to the athletic um uh, everyone knows all this crap that's all yeah it's true i'm happy to i'm happy to do this i think it's awesome what you guys are doing and I'm happy for Rob and Jeff that they got this thing going. I, yep. you know, technically whatever competition. I feel like college basketball is such like a communal space, though, where everyone knows each other and stuff like that, that everyone just wants everyone to exceed. And I feel that way uh, greatly about what's going on with the podcast network. And Rob and Jeff, I begrudgingly say, are good good dudes and, and friends and all that stuff. But uh, yeah. I think it's awesome. And any, any college basketball content's good content in my book. And I've been enjoying your show. So are you enjoying the podcast thing? Are you, are you yeah. feeling, how do you feel about interviewing people and all that stuff? Are you comfortable? Yeah, I like it. It's fun. Um, I love just perspectives. Yeah. I always love gaining at, no matter who it is, what position they're in. I love the perspective. My mom taught me that early on. Like everyone has a story. Sure. You just got to listen. Yeah, and so I, I like I like that stuff, and and I'm hoping to kind of get some of these guys to open up. Like it's easy with you, right? You know, mm -hmm. you, this is this is your game. Like this mm -hmm. is exactly what you do. And like, all right, let me try and deep dive. Let me try and get a little more of the story from some of these guys, a little, little bit different angle. But uh, it's been fun trying to trying to figure it out. And yeah, I hope, hope I can keep continue doing it. Love it. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right.